Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with gubernatorial candidate and lifelong New Mexican Attorney General Gary King. Uh, he served a dozen years in, in the uh, State House of Representatives, uh, ran against uh, Steve Pierce in 2004 and unhappily lost, uh, was elected uh, Attorney General of the State of New Mexico in 2006, and was re-elected in 2010. He, he holds a Ph.D. degree in uh, organic chemistry and has served as an environmental consultant and advisor to uh, the Department of Energy. It's great to have you with us today. Thanks. You know, it's a real pleasure to get a chance to talk to you about some of the issues that are important in New Mexico, and uh, and, and I appreciate the mention of my uh, of my background in science and, and, and the environment because that's, that's something that's really been important to me as we go along. So. I'd like to focus this interview, if I can, on a number of things, but on your assessment of the governor, the current governor's uh, uh, performance in office, uh, what you would do differently, what your vision for New Mexico's future is. I'd like to dwell at length on water scarcity, water conservation, uh, potential conflicts over the Colorado River Compact, uh, and the suit brought by Texas against New Mexico over the Rio Grande. Uh, I know our viewers would also love to hear uh, from you about the Curtin Air Force spill, and, uh, and also if we have a chance, uh, if we have time to talk about uh, the uh, uh, Justice Department's investigation in the Albuquerque Police Department. But first, um, I'd like to talk to you about the behavioral health issue uh, and, and the audits that your office is investigating at the moment. Um, many Democrats, myself included, uh, see what's going on is a travesty of justice, really. Um, some 15 providers are accused, audited, um, and then um, basically defunded. Their reputations are ruined. They're replaced by Republican operatives from Arizona, and um, they have no chance to defend themselves. So uh, as an old, sort of, as an old um, uh, professor at the university who teaches uh, uh, some things about constitutional law. I'm thinking to myself, this has to be a Sixth Amendment issue, doesn't it? Uh, you have um, you have a whole bunch of people who are accused basically of a felony, uh, who have no chance to see the evidence against them, and who uh, and whose lives and professions are basically ruined. So I would love to hear. I don't know, our viewers would love to hear your view as the Attorney General on these matters. Well, I have to agree that. Um the, 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 the general state of affairs with regard to the behavioral health system is is a bad one for, uh, I think that the re result so far has not been uh, good for New Mexico. It, it hasn't been good for, um, f particularly for the clients, for the patients who, uh, who have found themselves, I think, uh, tossed into this, this difficult situation. Um, some of of what we are doing, I, you know, I'm constrained to do because of my job as as the attorney general. Right. And uh, one thing that's important for people to understand is that the provision of Medicaid occurs through our human services department, right. uh, and and that the job that falls to the attorney general is we have what's called the Medicaid fraud unit, and so our job is to investigate fraud, and and then to to deal with that. And and the law re keeps those two entities separate because because of. The, you know the importance of of looking for fraud being different from the provision of the service, right. and and there are new rules and regulations under the Affordable Care Act that have made the result here a lot harsher, and we've tried to explain those to people. But um, by and large, the the way this works is that the human services department, who are the providers, are, are required to to audit and to and to manage and to look at look into the provision of services, and if they find what are called credible allegations of fraud in the regulation, then they're they're supposed to refer that to my fraud agency, and at the same time, the the new regulations require them to place these uh, check holds, you know, to suspend payments to the providers until such time as they're either cleared or 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 some sort of um, charges are brought against them. And, uh, and I think one of the things in this system that has caused difficulty is, is the, a, a quick decision by the Human Services Department uh, based on a, essentially a single audit to refer those to our agency 
uh, and claim credible allegations of fraud. Um, we haven't commented further on that very much because because I have you know legal obligations to investigate fraud once it's sent to me and and I have significantly increased the number of people that I have working in my mm. Medicaid fraud unit. Mm. And we're paying for that out of our own hide, basically. We don't get more federal money because we have bigger problems or whatever. And so, but I, I've, I've moved a lot of, of agents. But um, the, the, the harsh result is, is the check hold, the, the, the suspension of payments, that's not really related to whether there's actual fraud or not. And I think it's important for people to understand that allegations of fraud don't necessarily mean that all of these providers either are or are not guilty of fraud. Sure. Um, but they base their decision on, on a statistical testing of like 100, um, 100 billings or something sure. like that. Once they give it to us, for us to find whether there's fraud or not fraud, we have to look at every single billing. And so there's 30,000 clients. There, there are thousands of pages of documents that my investigators have to go through. And I have forensic accountants and investigators who, who literally now compare um, you know, uh, one cell in an Excel spreadsheet from the billing to another one, you know, that, that we get provided by the providers uh, for, um, for what they've actually done um, in order to do that. So it, it's, a, it's a painstaking process. Where the due process comes in is, is of course, under the Constitution, is if we charge them with a crime, then, then they, all of those due process things, the Sixth Amendment, and the, you know, come into play. But until they do, the, the harsh result really has to do with the fact that, that there, there have been allegations made against them and, and they're not getting paid. And obviously they can't continue to do business if they're not getting paid. So I, I think it's a difficult situation. Um, I find myself in a position where if I just said, ah, eh, I can't believe that, that these people would all be guilty of fraud and, and, and turn it back, that, that wouldn't really be appropriate for a law enforcement agency because uh, if I was wrong, if, if there were fraud there, then you know, there would be some, some, some problems on my part for not, for not rooting it out. Um, but, but it is time consuming on our part and, and, and I believe that, that the result to the providers and potentially to the, um, to the clients is kind of harsh. And, and we have, you know, we, we've tried to send some messages both publicly and privately to the uh, Human Services Department. I think they're the ones that have the, the discretion to, to see that, that, there, that there are bad results that are occurring to, to patients, to clients, and, and, and they have some discretion under the law, and, and we're all trying to figure out how much discretion they have, to lift the check hold if they think that there's damage be, being done to the system. Now, of course, their, their position in this is that they've been able to bring in these providers from Arizona and that the providers from Arizona are, are making sure that there's no break in service. And, and, and that is something where there's been a lot of discussion, I think, about whether, whether there is a break in service. And, and that, that's their obligation. And, and so it, it's been very difficult. And all I can say is that, that we, I understand um, the difficulty that's put a lot of people in, that, that we are pressing as, as hard as we can press with the resources that we have to either clear uh, people that the allegations have been made against or in cases where we find fraud. Um, you know, to bring those to court and, and give those folks an opportunity to defend themselves. But um, it's, it's a pretty difficult situation, and I think had it been handled differently by the Human Services Department, uh, you know, th there might have been some opportunity for people to, um, to talk about those, those allegations of fraud be before they became, quote, credible and, and referred to our office. But the question on a lot of people's minds is what happens if... if um these agencies uh, are proven to be guiltless of fraud. Do they have any recourse after that? Is there any way that they that they can sue uh, the department uh, that uh, defunded them? Um, which leads me to another question, to a broader question: Is uh, what uh, what is your assessment as a candidate and as an attorney general of the way the Martinez administration has been running state government? Well, I, I think that. Um that the providers have certainly, you know, are probably talking to their own private attorneys as, as to what their, their recourse might be. Um, I would hope that as, as we review these 15 different agencies, that, that, that the ones that we can clear, that we can clear them as quickly as we can. But um, I believe for the, the funds that they've lost during this time period, you know, they'll, they'll have to be able to potentially prove that they're you know that there was some wrongdoing or some violation of of their contractual obligations mm -hmm. and and the be, because of the the way that the um that the regulations are set up 
I actually believe it'll be rather difficult for them to to recoup the the money that they lost, you know, that wasn't being paid during that time period when that occurred. Um, but there again, I, I think it'll be up to them to to make a determination. Interesting enough, in the attorney general's office, we can't give private legal advice to you know to entities, and and so so I try not to weigh in on that too much. But I, I think that they'll have. I know that people are talking about that and they're looking at, at what they can do, but um, I, I believe that it'll be difficult for them to recoup the, the losses that they've had during the, during this time period. Um, with regard to the to the administration overall, one of the reasons I'm running for governor is because I think that New Mexico can do a lot better. Um, I, I'm fortunate that I that I learned at the knee of, of Bruce King, who I think was a good administrator, and and one of the things that he did was he 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 did a good job of appointing cabinet secretaries, judges, you know, the the people the, that it takes to run government. Mm -hmm. um, he did a good job of working with the legislature to do positive things, and and those are all things that I think that Governor Martinez has failed at. I I think that um, that in three years she has. Um, proven that, that she is, is not skillful at working with the legislature um, to carry out sort of the day-to-day -day things that need to be done to take care of the state. She, she focused on um, trying to take driver's licenses away from, from immigrants uh, to, to the extent that I think that she didn't focus on a lot of other things that are much more important yeah. in the legislature. Um, she will, will tout as her biggest success, I think, a tax break for corporations. Uh, but I haven't seen anything to show that that tax break for corporations has improved our economy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that um, the biggest problem, concern that we have in New Mexico is the fact that we've dropped to 50th as a good place to raise children. Um, and, and I haven't seen any, any approaches on behalf of the administration and the legislature to address that issue. Um, and one of the groups that I've been working with uh, over the course of the last couple of years is uh, the New Mexico Voices for Children and, and other co uh, you know, folks in a coalition to try and, and put more money into early childhood education in New Mexico, which I think is one of the most important things that we could do. And, and the governor really fought that. She opposed it and, and basically said, uh, we, you know, we've recommended $10 million for early childhood education. That's, that should be sufficient. And, and it's, it's not sufficient. So I, I think that, that prioritizing what's important in New Mexico has, has, has not been something that she's been good at. Um, I, I think that, um, that, that our government is broken right now. I, there, there are many agencies that aren't functioning well. Uh, workforce solutions, uh, in, in a time when, when we have the highest unemployment that we've had in many years, are, have, have been totally ineffective at helping people that, you know, that are having problems with their, uh, with their unemployment compensation. Uh, people have been on on hold for hours and hours, or they can't get a, in touch with the agency. Uh, frankly, there are there are business entities that I'm aware of that that want to pay their unemployment taxes and such, and and they're having the same problems. And when they call, they get put on hold. So I mean, I'm, you know, you need agencies that that function. Um, we're dealing quite a lot with uh, with issues with the New Mexico Environment Department right now, and 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 there's one where I think that. Um, you know there there is um, sort of a clear policy on behalf of the governor to roll back environmental regulations on the oil and gas industry on on the mining industry the the copper industry, the copper industry. and and we you know we've been doing what we can within the attorney general's office to try and and make sure that we're protecting our, our groundwater resources because once you pollute those groundwater resources you're never going to get them back yeah. you know you can talk about cleaning them up but the cleanup costs are much more expensive than the cost of preventing the pollution in the first right, place right, right. Um, and and I, I think the human services department has had some issues besides the behavioral health issue which which like I said is is actually very complicated and so you know there are lots of difficulties there you know we have the example recently of the secretary saying that she's not aware of hunger issues <laughs> amongst children in the right. US when we're number 50 in 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 um, uh, in in the issue of children in poverty and particularly children that are um, I'm, I'm looking for the word but uh, I think that uh, that they they call it food insecurity, yes, you know, that, exactly. and so yeah. uh, it, it's more than just being hungry. It's it's not knowing where your next meal is going to come from, or or not being able to provide, you know, healthy meals over the course of time. And if we don't provide healthy meals for our children, then, um, you, you know, then then they're not going to be able to learn. They're not going to be able to be successful. So I, I think that there are lots of problems there. So, when you have a, a governor who tries to 
run our offices by private emails and other things, and transparency becomes a, a joke in my judgment. Um, you also have a, an opportunity to, I mean, there's a stark difference between what a Democrat would do, I think, and what she's doing, or what a particular Democrat might do. What would you do differently? How would you contrast yourself to, to this uh, way far-right uh, non-leader in New Mexico? Well, I think it's important to know who you represent. Um, you know, it was one of the things I learned in, as a lawyer and, and, and being a, a state representative and, and, and working as the attorney general. And, and, and I think it's become clear over three years that, uh, that the current governor um, really has, has been working primarily with, with certain big multinational corporations. Um, she, she had this meeting with the, the Koch brothers, right. you know, the, the secret meeting where, where they, they met for three days. And um, I've told people I don't know exactly what they were talking about, but I kind of doubt that one of the items on the agenda is what we're going to do to make New Mexico a better place for working people in New Mexico, for children in New Mexico, for, you know, for, for senior citizens in New Mexico. That, that's just not their issue. And, and for me, you know, I've spent my whole career, um, the, the first bill that I really passed of, of major import in the legislature was called the Family Violence Protection Act. But it's, you know, I've been working with victims of domestic violence. My office currently is working to protect victims of human trafficking. Uh, you know, we actually been recognized around the country as a state that's being proactive and, and working to protect victims of domestic violence and such. And, and, and we also have a uh, what we call the um, uh, wage theft task force. I mean, one of the things that we're interested in is is whether or not working people, besides getting a decent living wage, which the governor vetoed an increase in right. the in the in the minimum wage uh, in the last legislative session, but um, there there are certain ways that that corporate entities will will reduce the wages that they're paying people by making them work off the clock or making them work overtime and not paying for for overtime or or, or various things like that. And so, you know, I I think that. Um, you know, my goal in, in representing uh, people in New Mexico through all my career has been to represent people that don't have a voice, that, you know, that don't have powerful lobbyists. And, and so, therefore, I, I am not the darling of the banking lobby or, uh, or the cigarette lobby or, uh, you know, I could mention a, a, a number of groups that are not very happy with the work that I've done in the legislature. Um, uh, we, uh, a group of attorneys general, you know, sued the five largest lending institutions in the country yeah. over their mortgage practices. And, and, and when the federal government wasn't able to do anything, the attorneys general were able to do something. And, and we now have a program in place to try and help people stay in their homes and, and keep their homes. And I'm very proud of the, you know, the work that we've done uh, to do that. But I, I think my vision for New Mexico is really one of, um, you know, where, where everybody has an opportunity to do better. Uh, and and certainly my vision is not one where we're 50th and everything that's bad, you know, that's 50th and everything that's good, and and first and everything that's bad. Uh, but so we have to address issues of poverty, uh, because that's that drives a lot of our problems in New Mexico. And a way to do that is to help small businesses, uh, micro businesses, you know, the people that have one or two employees. If we can help them to generate a better climate. Uh, and you know, if a business that has four people adds one more person, that's twenty percent growth. Right, right. And so you know, it's it's not magic. It's just a matter of of you know, setting your priorities and 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 doing what you need to do to help uh, people. And I and I don't believe in the trickle down theory. I believe in the you know in in the work yourself up theory. So that we need to help people that that need a hand. That the uh, that that those folks that the governor is currently. Uh, representing are you know are powerful entities that that will be able to take care of themselves the the mining industry the the oil and gas industry the and and, and not that I want to say that any of those are bad we we need industry in New Mexico sure. and, and but but they should follow the rules they should play by the rules they should be fair to their workers they should be uh, you know they sh they should be concerned about about how New Mexico is doing and and not not really harm our people, at, you know, at the expense of their bottom line. So everyone who, who spends any time looking at the land in New Mexico knows that we're in uh, probably the 13th or 14th year of an extended drought. Uh, we had a, a huge rain uh, down south about two or three weeks ago. Carlsbad um, has enough water to last a year now, apparently, and they're slightly relieved, but uh, they're still going to trying to make their priority call, I think, on Roswell and other things. So we're in a terrible time. I don't, I haven't heard really hardly anyone speak about water in any major way in Albuquerque or around the state. 
except the people who are affected by it. So I'm really curious as to what your views on water scarcity and water, water conservations are. And I know you've been very outspoken about the Texas suit against New Mexico, and I'd love to hear you elaborate on that and explain that to our viewers uh, in some detail, if you could. Well, I, you know, I think that, that everything in New Mexico depends on water. I mean, we, we live in an arid state, and so whatever other natural resources we have, if we run out of water, then, then we're, you know, we're, we won't be able to do anything else. And so, so it's always been a major concern to me. And, and there are two issues. One is quantity of water, and the other is quality of yes. water, both of which I've worked on qu quite a lot in my career. But uh, as Attorney General, I have a, a, a division, a unit that's called Water, Environment, and Utilities, and so they, they focus on those. And, and with regard to the, the issue on the lower Rio Grande that generated the Texas versus New Mexico water lawsuit, it, it's something that I've been studying since I was in law school, and I just had my 30th class reunion for my law school class. And, and so, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a dispute that's of, one of long standing. Yeah. Um, but recently, a couple of years ago, there was an agreement made between the two irrigation districts there that were, were basically the, the New Mexico district, the Elephant Butte Irrigation District, agreed that they would send as much water to Texas for the what's called EP number one, the El Paso Irrigation District number one, um, as, as they wanted, and in return, the 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 Texas district would not sue New Mexico, um, no matter how much groundwater they pumped, essentially, oh, okay. and and so that. In the short term, that seemed to be a good solution for for all of the farmers down there, and and my family are farmers, and you know I understand how important farming is, but in the long run, it's totally unsustainable. I mean, it, it, if you send uh, eighty percent of water in the Rio Grande to Texas, which is much more than the compact allows for, the compact calls for forty six percent, I think, or forty three percent, forty three percent to go to Texas. Um, and, and then and then you make that up by pumping water out of the aquifer. Yeah. The 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 aquifer was dropping. Uh, New Mexico farmers who didn't have wells were suffering because they they weren't getting so, sort of the amount of water that's that that they should be getting under the compact. And 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 I think the trigger for that was um, two years ago, three years ago now. The the Bureau of Reclamation released some water out of Elephant Butte. That's what's called credit water for New Mexico. So it was totally New Mexico's water. And they released it in order to, to make some deliveries to Texas. And so we sued the Bureau of Reclamation and claimed that they didn't have authority to release that water. Um, th that then, depending on who you talk to, you know, may have triggered Texas to, you know, to, to bring a lawsuit to ask the U.S. Supreme Court in what's called an original jurisdiction matter, because states can sue each other in the right. Supreme Court. So the state of Texas has asked the Supreme Court to allow them to bring this action against New Mexico and basically claim that, that we have not met our compact obligations for a number of years and that somehow you know, the, the, the status for the last two or three years is what they would like, which is that they get 80% of the water and we get 20% of the water. <laughs> well, we, you know, we don't believe in that. We're, you know, we're fighting that. And, and I think um, people don't, uh, who are not lawyers, don't always understand these original actions. But we're actually still making our argument to the U.S. Supreme Court that, that they should not even hear that case. And so the Texas versus New Mexico is not a done deal in the Supreme Court. And our argument is we have this suit. In, in New Mexico where we've sued the Bureau of Reclamation, all the other parties can join that. And that it's, mu it's a much better idea to pursue those actions in the local federal court because they have the ability to hear evidence and take evidence and so we'll be able to bring in our engineers and they can bring in their engineers and, and we'll have that discussion. And, and I, I want to say that we've had very good support from the New Mexico State Engineer's Office, from their technical people, to, to help us to show what the, what the negative impact is on the aquifer overall you know, under under that system that was in place. But it's certainly my goal to make sure that, that we have water for 100 years, you know, for more than 100 years sure. for those people that live in the lower Rio Grande Valley. And, and there, you know, there are more than 100,000 people now that, that live in city of Las Cruces and, and those surroundings. And so, you know, this is not just about the farmers. This is about making sure that, that, that we have water for domestic uses and, and for industrial uses and for growth and all of those kinds of things. So, um so that's very important to me, and, and we have good lawyers that are working on that, and, and I believe in the long run that, that New Mexico will prevail in arguing that we've always met our compact obligations and, and that we should continue to meet them that way. Um, but, but we have asked our legislature to, to appropriate money to the, to the Attorney General's office, which they have, and to the State Engineer's office, to deal with these kind of litigation issues you know, wherever they may apply. And so you're right, in the, in the Pecos River Basin, we, you know, we think that they're... 
that there may be some issues and and there was this call on the river uh, or I think it was on the river uh, but where senior users were basically saying that, that that junior users should be cut off so that they could continue to exercise their senior water rights right. um, there is I think it might have been Steve Reynolds that said this or even somebody else that said it's better to be a, 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 a junior it's I want to say this right. It's better to be a junior user upstream with a shovel than it is to be a senior user downstream. <laughs> uh, and and so uh, you know there there are these issues about diversion and and all those things. And and fortunately we did have enough rain this year. You know that it, that it may be that the river will have enough water to meet everybody's usages mm -hmm. next year. But we can't count on that forever. And yeah. and when I was in the legislature, we certainly pressed to have a statewide water plan. And and we do have a statewide water plan. But I think that. That, that the state engineer needs the tools to enforce that. I think that the attorney general's office needs to be vigilant and, and work on that. Those are our, our duties and our goals. So water is one of our number one issues in the AG's office, but it's not as controversial as some of the other things yeah. that we work on. Yet. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> so just for everybody's uh, delight and edification, could you talk a little bit about what a junior user is and what a senior user is? As I understand, this has to do with uh, the law of prior appropriation, and Carlsbad claims that it's a senior user, and Roswell is a junior to them. Mm -hmm. But also, I think uh, uh, this has also something to do with groundwater pumping, mm -hmm. which which is uh, similar on the Pecos as it is on the Rio Grande. Am I right about that? Yes, in certain basins, there you know there's uh, there there's a connection between the underground water and and the water in the river. Certainly in the lower Rio Grande. In parts of the Pecos, and so in, in New Mexico, we we indeed have the the law of prior appropriation and and the law of beneficial use, which is and, and those are laws that were developed in arid climates that basically say if if you develop a water right in New Mexico, you have to show that you're putting that water to some beneficial use, and the amount of water that you can use depends on your use. If you're growing alfalfa, for instance, you might get three or three and a half acre feet of water every year to to water your alfalfa, and and um, by and large, the, those users who started using the water and perfected one of their beneficial uses earlier in time should have a better right than those people that have it later in time. And so if, if you're on a river and you know you use so much water out of the river that you're allowed or you pump so much water from underground that you're allowed um, and, and, and if somebody who has a junior use, one that's later in time, and, and we'll use underground water for that, um, if somebody comes and drills a well next to your well and they pump water and it's impacting the amount of water that comes out of your well and you have a senior right you can go to the state engineer or to the courts and ask them to enforce uh, you know stopping the the junior rights pumping if, if it impacts or interferes with with your rights so they call that an impairment mm -hmm. uh, and and we have lots of impairment cases in New Mexico that are sort of smaller cases where where somebody has a right and they and, and they try and and block a, a new usage or, or something like that but but on the river on the Pecos River um, you know that over the over the course of years, the, the the river got completely appropriated. Every you know everybody was using as much as they could use, and so and then the there's one where where a number of years ago we didn't deliver the amount of water we were supposed to deliver to Texas under the compact, and so there was a settlement in New Mexico where we agreed that we would would under the penalty of a fairly major monetary penalties that we would deliver the amount of water that we should deliver every year to Texas, and in order to make that up and and there was a fellow named uh Joe Stell who was a state representative from Carlsbad that was very important in all of these issues he got the state to uh to start dealing with that to appropriate money but they they would either buy water rights from from junior users and get them not to use those rights so that the water would stay in the river um, or they actually drilled some wells and were pumping water into the river from the underground aquifer to make sure that it did. And, and that's been where some of the issue has come, is that a lot of people feel like uh, the pumping of water from underground to make sure that Texas gets all of the supplies that they need has an impact on other wells in the area, and, and, and perhaps those rights are more senior rights. And so well, probably, it's, yeah. yeah, it's so, and, and, and then the irrigation districts have rights that go way back, a lot of them. And so, so, so those irrigation districts um, sometimes battle with each other and sometimes battle with the new users. And in this case, sometimes battle with the state because the state is trying to, to deal with those. And so it becomes a very uh, complex issue. And, and that's why water rights cases, uh, these adjudications, they call them, where they try and settle everybody's rights, sometimes go on for 30 or 40 years. Yeah. 
Um, I think the state actually just signed off, uh, as did the federal government and others, on, on a water rights dispute in northern New Mexico. Uh, I want to say that's the Amat case. Yes. Uh, that and and Mr. Amat died, you know, during the course of the time that the that the case was going on, because it took forty years. But um, and because that involved Indian water rights too, which are different than everything else that I've described. But that would be a course instead of just a few minute answer. <laughs> yes. uh, but but it's I think it is important, you know, for us to protect those water rights that people have so that they know that they can count on on that and so that's that's the basis of those lawsuits i think in the long run is going to be how, how much is the state willing to to put themselves in in the way to to enforce the the rights of senior users so all of this has to do with water quantity issues um, sometimes folks like to say that uh, the water world is divided up into quality people and quantity people the quality uh, probably in, in my mind anyway the greatest quality problem in our state has to do with with the Kirtland Air Force uh, a base spill of some 24 million gallons of jet fuel spill, much larger than the uh, Superfund site in the South Valley where GE used to be. Um, what, uh, uh, how do you feel, how do you feel the state is handling this and uh, to what degree can, can we, uh, can New Mexico put the, uh, the screws, if you will, to mm -hmm. the federal government and, and to the military to actually do something about this. Well, as, as I've said, I have excellent lawyers that, that work on these issues. Yeah. And, uh, but with regard to the Kirtland spill, and, and you know, credit should always be given where credit is due, the, uh, the New Mexico Environment Department has had uh, people that have been working on that issue. And, and so we should back up and talk a little bit about the issue. Indeed, I think that people feel like there, there was a, a, a crack or a leak in a, in a fuel pipeline that, that used to pump fuel, jet fuel back and forth or whatever, and, and that there was a significant pool of, of, of fuel and, or other organic chemicals that are, that are floating on top of or, or getting into the, the water that's in that area. And so for, for a number of years, they've been trying to uh, siphon the, the, you know, the fuel off of the top of that. Uh, and I think that the that the federal government has participated in that. They they haven't um, they haven't said that it's not their obligation or something like that. But a, a lot of people recently have been very concerned about whether or not the the contamination that's in the groundwater is moving towards one of the well fields for the city of Albuquerque. And obviously, if you get that organic contamination in water that's going into the well field, uh, it, it creates a health hazard. Uh, at a minimum, the city would have to clean up the water in some way once they pump it out of the ground before they can use it. Um, and so, so I think that there's been a lot of focus on how we're going to clean up the, the organics that are in the groundwater. And um, the, the Environment Department, I, my lawyers have, have talked to and have been working with the, the Environment Department and, and feel like the Environment Department has been uh, you know, working that issue adequately and have been, you know, trying to, to make sure that the federal government meets their obligation. There's something called the, um, the I, I have to think of what it's called now, uh, the Federal Facilities, um, Federal Facilities Compliance Act, the FFCA. And so that actually gives us as a state the opportunity to enforce environmental laws against the federal government. Otherwise, they use their sovereign immunity and right, say you right, can't right, sue right, us because right. of sovereign immunity. And and so so there's one where I think that 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 all of us are working together. Um, you know, I I would hope that that we do a, a good job and maybe a better job of of testing the water. You know, in that area where where we think that the plume is flowing, and 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 if it moves faster than we think it's going to move, then obviously more resources need to be put into that. And that's where the state, I think, could uh, could try and pressure under the, the, the authority we have, the federal government, to spend more money. Now, I have to say, here may be a problem. When the federal government is shut down, I know. you know, I, I, I think that that could impact, you know, their ability to continue to work on that cleanup. And, and, and obviously, the, the, the water that's flowing with the pollution is not going to wait while we sort out, you know, whether we're going to be able to spend federal money on that or not. So, uh, I, that would be a good thing for me to be looking into. Would be to to, to see you know what programs are being funded and what are not. And and um, the 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 attorneys general in the West have actually brought sent two letters to the federal government regarding the sequestration, right. where. Uh, the Department of Interior announced that they weren't going to pay all their royalty payments, basically, or, or at least all of their payments on, on oil properties here. And, and all the Western AG sent them a letter and said, this is not federal money. 
this is state money that's that, that, that the federal government collects, but then they have an obligation to pay it to us. And, and in the long run, the Department of Interior agreed to that. So there may be things that we can do, you know, in, in the Attorney General's office to work with uh, the Department of Energy to make sure that they're expending the funds that they have for cleanup and, and that they don't get sequestered or that they don't get lost and, and all of that. And, and, and my experience in working with the Department of Energy actually at least gives me some knowledge as to how you know who has the money and where it is and, and, and how it can be spent. It certainly requires a lot of support from our federal delegation, from our senators yeah. particularly, and, and we're blessed in New Mexico with having Senator Udall and Senator Heinrich who care a lot about those issues right. and, and are working on them too. So the key there is for all of us to work together and, and, and get that cleaned up. It, it can be done, and I think if we see that the plume is flowing you know, faster uh, then, then we're being able to clean it up, that, that we need to all make a lot of noise and make sure that more resources are put into it to do that. So a lot of us who have been studying Air Force uh, uh, base spills realize that there are uh, you know, maybe 50 or 60 of them in the country, and that they go very, very slowly, and most of them, all of them, are much smaller than this one. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, um, uh, a number of other people have said that we have not spent anywhere near enough money to characterize the actual nature of the underground water, that we need to have a lot more wells, and that, and that we need to examine it a lot better. How's, how's that, um, how's that going to get played out if we don't have any money? Well, that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, I, I do think that it requires that, that we be the squeaky wheel, you know, that, yeah. that, um, that, that our federal counterparts understand that, that, we, that we know what's going on, that we're keeping track of what's going on. Um, I think we should push for, for more characterization. I, I think that's important. I, in, in my career as a chemist, I actually worked on characterization of under, underground water. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually, we, we helped to develop a, a system that, that looked at the flow of underground water because sometimes you need to know how fast it's flowing and what direction it's flowing. Right. And so it's not, not only just knowing what's in the water, it's knowing where it's going, too. And so, so I, I agree with you. I, I think that the proof will be in the pudding in a way as, as far as how we all work together. And, and there's one, it, it goes back to what I said about the Congress. We all need to put our egos aside in something like this and, and work, you know, the, the AG's office and the Environment Department and, and the city of Albuquerque and, and the U.S. government, you know, the Air Force and all. We, we all need to recognize that this is an issue that impacts people and that we all need to work together because that's what they elected us to do and that's what they appointed us to do. So um, I, I think it is something that, that, that I will make sure that, that I have continued to assign my best environmental lawyers to, to, to keep an eye on that and work on it. But, um, uh, you know, we're, we're counting on the Environment Department to, to do their part of the job too. And, and right now, like I said, to the best of my knowledge, they are doing so. So I know as uh, the Chief Law Enforcement Officer in the, in the state of New Mexico that uh, uh, you must have been following the uh, the Justice Department's analysis of the Albuquerque Police Department vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, all of these shootings and other things. I'm wondering what uh, what the, what the Attorney General thinks about how that's how that's proceeding mm -hmm. and um, uh, where it's going to go. Well, we uh, I, I am very interested actually, as the Attorney General also said, as the chair of what's called the Law Enforcement Academy Board, which does the certification of law enforcement officers, and mm -hmm. and and we. Um, for instance, we, we, we've tried to really beef up the requirements for police agencies to report uh, wrongdoing by their individual officers. You know, the, the, the board can't really do anything about certification if the police chiefs don't report that. So we, we instituted a, a plan for quarterly reports from the, from the chiefs so that, so that they, they have to positively report that there's no incident if there are no incidents, but it doesn't allow them the opportunity to, to, to not report something that does occur. And so that that's important. We uh, our state legislature passed like an anti-profiling statute, uh, which which may apply in in a lot of cases like this, and uh, and it, it has fallen on the AG's office to enforce the the fact that that agencies have their their anti-profiling um, uh, plans in place and that, and that they report pro, you know complaints about profiling activities to us and so we're you know we we get reports on those and we we certainly are are working with APD to make sure that they comply with all those. So, I mean, there are certain things that we do where we have a little bit of oversight. I don't have, even though I'm the state's chief law enforcement officer, I don't have specific purview over the individual police agencies. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, we're certainly aware of, of the investigation that's being done by the Department of Justice. I, I, we, we don't participate in that uh, mm -hmm. in a in, in a one-on-one -on -one kind of way. I mean, if they ask us for any help, we certainly would be willing to give that. But I, I don't have 
personal knowledge of, about that. But but we in 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 something that impacts all of that, I think our office issued a report on the on the Mary Han death mm -hmm. and the um, and and what we thought were significant procedural errors that, that occurred in, in the investigation of, of that death. And we reported those uh, publicly and, and also to, the, to APD uh, in, in hopes that, you know, that they would recognize that there were significant problems there and change their policies, frankly. And so I, I think that um, we try and work with community groups and, and we certainly, we get complaints and the ones that we think fall in the purview of the Department of Justice, we pass along to them. The ones that we have some authority over, we try and deal with on our own. Um, I, I believe that the that the amount of scrutiny that there is for APD now is 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 appropriate and and uh, you know I hope that it'll cause them to change some of their policies. I I am concerned that you know that the current mayor has kept essentially the same leadership in place even though the the chief retired. That um, you know that sometimes it's good just to have new blood. I think and and so. Um, you know, we'll, we get those things reported to us, both to the Law Enforcement Academy and to our office. And, and so I, I, I'm also sort of anxiously awaiting to, to see whether the Department of Justice files a similar report. And if they file a report and there are problems and, and we can help to enforce the changes, then certainly we would be happy to, to work with that, too. And, and there again, I, you know, we're all, we're all better and, and the public is safer if we can all work together. And, and there are some great police officers in APD that are out there doing their job. And I think a lot of our report had to do with the fact that the, that the brass weren't letting the, the rank and file officers do their do their work in a way that, that that they should be able to do it under standard operating procedures, and so, you know, I think that we'll see what the Department of Justice comes up with too. So just to wrap it all up, uh, what is um, your view of say the next eight or nine years? Are we are we uh, caught in a kind of economic uh, straitjacket that we can't get out of, or do you think we can we can innovate our way with this drought into a and with these water issues into a into a new way of looking at how we operate as a, as a state and as an economy. Well, New Mexico has a lot of untapped opportunity. I, you know, in the last three years, while the rest of the company has been coming out of recession, we've been mired in recession. And, and I think some of that is because we haven't focused on, on those issues that we talked about, about making sure that people get a decent living wage, uh, about making sure that we marshal our resources, particularly our water resources, so that we're using them wisely. Um, and, and, and we have a lot of opportunity there. And I, you know, I think that that because of our our good weather, because of our our um, you know relatively uh, accessible and inexpensive resources and great human resources, that that there's opportunity there to, to to grow and to develop. And I think that New Mexico can be a much better place. I think that we can bring ourselves out of the depths of poverty that we have. But we have to focus on those issues. I think that our that our students can do better. But but we have to focus on what we're doing there. And and I. Think for instance that that focusing on that zero to five age group, we know. I mean, there are studies to show that that if if children from zero to five do well, if if they have good nutrition and if they have good uh, opportunities to to develop their learning capabilities and such, that they'll be better. And so, uh, you know, th those kinds of changes need to be made now, so that ten years down the road, and certainly twenty years down the road, that that New Mexico really comes becomes the first in, in all of those good things and not, not last in all of those good things. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future, but it's going to take cooperation. It's going to take a governor that can work with everybody involved, the, the cities, the counties, the, the legislature, um, to actually put into play um, th those protections and, and, and incentives that we need in order to grow that way. Well, thank you very, very much. It's been, a, it's been a real pleasure talking with you. Good, thanks. Uh, these are a uh, great opportunity.